Okay, first off, I just want to say hello. Thank you for having me. I would love to extend my appreciation to the Master Gardeners. Growing up, my grandmother was a huge part of them um, until she passed, and so I have very fond memories, and I just appreciate all the work that you guys do. Um, so today, I'm going to leave this pretty basic, just because as Master Gardeners, uh, you have a huge appreciation for plants and more knowledge about plants. I don't really know much about plants, but I do know a lot about trees. Um, and I feel like maybe you guys don't know a whole lot about trees. So we're just going to make sure we cover the basics. Um, first, I'll start off by introducing myself again. Um, also, very uncomfortable that I can be Googled. <laughs> that was the most uncomfortable I'd ever been. <laughs> Um, but yeah, my name is Maddie. I grew up in Lindale. Um, I got a degree from Mississippi State University in uh, Natural Resource Management in the School of Forest Resources. Most of my background is actually in forestry, not so much arboriculture. So I have um, more experience in forest hydrology, forest soils, and land stewardship. So arboriculture has been kind of a, you know, a new venture for me, and I have really appreciated it. It's even deepened my appreciation for trees did not know that was possible. So, I am the city forester for Tyler. Uh, that means I'm responsible for running the urban forestry program. That urban forestry program consists of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it can be, you know, sometimes it's a little, little bit of a headache, but it's a great job, love it, couldn't be any more happy. So, moving forward, we'll just ask a very simple question, why do we love trees? And I wanna hear it, why do you guys love trees? Shade, beautification, landscape, wildlife, fruit, fruit, climb them, absolutely. My boyfriend's a, an ar a climbing arborist and he's always in them. <laughs> oh, the monkey puzzle or the monkey tree? Well, I don't do that during work, but maybe, maybe afterwards. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. So coming from a science background, what I really appreciate are definitely, you know, the environmental benefits. This is kind of more what I studied. So, you know, they're great for air quality. They're great for carbon sequestration. They're great for cooling the temperatures around us. And that's especially important in an urban environment when we have a lot of concrete. So um, we'll move into that a little bit more. But then also energy conservation. Uh, stormwater mitigation, also a really big component in a city. Uh, when you have more concrete, you have more stormwater, it leads to more pollution, environmental degradation. So, And then, of course, wildlife habitat. You brought up my wildlife trees. I'm glad somebody appreciates them. Um, it was a really fun thing to do. So what I have done is I've gone out into the, into the city if there's a tree that's dead, dying, or if it's being reported, but I don't see the need for it to come down, not necessarily that it won't fall down, it might, but I'm never going to leave a tree up that would pose a lot of risk. All trees hold risk, and I'll get into that more as we move forward. Um, let's see here. Okay, so this is, I thought this would be interesting just to show you guys, uh, these are thermal cameras, just showing the difference between buildings and concrete and just vegetation, and just kind of illustrate how important it is to have trees around. I know that not everyone truly appreciates them and what they have to offer, but this right here should sway anyone because we have something called the urban heat island effect where these urban spaces are just getting really, really hot, especially as we develop, and those areas get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, um, so a city can be up to like 13 degrees hotter than in a rural area just next door. So something to prioritize moving forward and towards developers, if you know any developers. Just saying. <laughs> um, and then, of course, another huge reason for homeowners, especially, would be aesthetics. You don't really want to look at a house if it doesn't have any landscaping, correct? You know, it raises property values, it raises rental prices, which could be a good or a bad thing, depending who you're asking. Um, and then it just looks nice, you know? It's just. Beautiful. I believe this right here, where my cursor is, I believe that's the Arboretum in Dallas. Okay, let's see here. And then here's just some more fun facts. If you're still not uh, sold that you should like trees, uh, um, they've actually shown that it, trees can help uh, increase healing recovery times in hospital patients. 
uh, great for your mental health. Forest bathing is a huge thing in Japan. People go f to um, for their mental health to calm down, to manage their stress. I know that if I'm not getting out into the woods at least twice a week, I, I get buzzy. <laughs> and um, again, just raises property values. So again, with the developers in the room, not going to say any names. Uh, it's just goes back to why you should prioritize. Even if you don't see the need to appreciate the environmental concerns for property values and for, I'm talking in circles at this point, but you know. <laughs> Monetary reasons as well, money's always there. Um, but that being said, we love trees, but they always have obstacles. They will always hold risk. That is something you can't deny. So the, especially when you are a homeowner, you have beautiful trees in your yard. The, so the purpose of this lecture today is for you to realize that you need to become more tree aware. You need to be able to look at your tree and know that it will hold risk. It might look good, but it might be really sick. You're not, not always sure. So curing tree blindness, which is a very real thing. So many people can just look at a tree and be like, oh yeah, that's a tree and move on. Oh, that's pretty and move on. But when you start looking at the details of a tree, you can start seeing, well, maybe there's more to this. What can we do to mitigate the risk? What can we do to save us some money, save some uh, property damage, some personal damage? So tree failure is always an option, is always possible. So, but I will say it's not always going to happen. You know, like it will eventually happen, but there are different types of tree failures and it's always site and tree specific. So. You could have one site where you have three really great trees that are doing super well, they're healthy, they're thriving, but then you have one other tree who maybe isn't quite acclimated to that area and then that tree gets sick and that tree is showing signs of decline and that tree might fail. Um, so there can be biological reasons, fungi, vigor, decay, uh, it just gets sick, something you can't always help. Um, it could be the climate. Maybe you had an extreme weather event. So I don't know, did we have a freeze last year? I, I feel like we did. Um, so I'm sure you guys have all seen the effects of that. And I think that has opened up a lot of people's eyes. Working with the city, all of a sudden, I had a bunch of people who never gave two cares about um, trees start ringing me up, start ringing me up. And I just had phone calls and phone calls, emails after emails. All the pine trees are dead. All the oak trees are dead. Um, so I think that really opened people's eyes up to trees. And then also mechanics and structure. So cracks like frost cracks, uh, weak branch unions, leans, and girdling roots. Girdling roots are a really big one uh, because they often go unnoticed because they're down on the ground. When you're looking at a tree, you're not always looking at the base of a tree. You're typically looking at the leaves or the structure, appreciating that, not so much the ground. But we'll get into that when we go into proper tree selection. And then, of course, site changes. If you guys are a homeowner, if you guys are doing any sort of construction on your property, or if you're removing something, or you're grading, that can all lead to changes in what that tree can withstand. So Take, take grading, for example. If you grade too close to a tree, you are disturbing the roots. That can weaken the tree, which can lead to tree failure. See right here. Um, so this, this situation right here most, li most likely was an oversaturated area. If you're overwatering your yard and you let the water collect, it can weaken the roots. And then if it gets really windy, it, that tree is going to be wind fell and it's going to fall. Uh, what'd you say? Ice is possible, ice, yeah. Ice can make the branches really heavy, which can then cause too much top weight, cause the tree to fail. This top picture, though, most likely had some sort of cavity at the bottom, and it just was structurally unsound, and it got too big, and it just buckled. So. Another thing to consider is root invasion. So, <laughs> unfortunately, it, it's, one of the harder things to recognize just because where are roots, they're underground. Where are your pipes, they're most likely underground unless they're underneath your home. And then, uh, so keeping that in mind, this all comes back to making sure you have the right trees planted in the right place. And so you can see this top picture, some roots had gotten into a pipe and busted it. And then over here, getting into the driveway. So again, just making sure uh, that you have the correct trees in the right spot. 
But there are things you can do. You can have, you can install barriers, but more than anything, you're going to need to do some regular inspections and again, making sure that you were not planting in the wrong spot. The, the prevention is the best remedy. Because unfortunately, trees are dynamic. You know, they are living organisms and they have personalities just like us. They grow however they want. Genetics play a huge role. So understanding the patterns in their behavior is the best way to, uh, to choose which trees to go where. But there are resources that have plenty of information. I actually have one up here that we'll see in a few slides. Uh, but then I also just have some, some uh, big culprits <laughs> for the ones that are most likely to cause a lot of damage. So like foundation issues, anything with that has those big trees, big roots, they're most likely to cause a lot of issues to damage uh, to the foundation. And then pipe disruption, it's really those like hydrophilic plants, so like bald cypress and beech, mulberry, cottonwood, things like that. They're more likely to be the ones to bust into your pipes. They sense the water, they'll go after it. They're thirsty, which I am too, actually. <laughs> and then let's see. And then, of course, aesthetic issues. You know, if you have um, debris, like a lot of people don't like sweet gums. Isn't that right, Ken? And then, uh, <laughs> and then staining issues. If you are someone who appreciates an immaculate sidewalk or driveway, you don't like stains, they turn you off then making sure you're not having a fruiting tree right above your sidewalk. Um, I, for one, love seeing sweet gumballs and uh, I love seeing berries on the ground just because usually with that accompanies like seeing little critters going after them. I care more about the tree than the, than the driveway, but you know, some people have what they prefer. They like to look fresh and clean and that makes total sense. So just keeping that in mind. And then this all comes back to what you can do. And I'm going to take a sip of water real quick. So the two biggest things are definitely to have right tree, right place mentality, and then proper tree care. So right tree, right place. Does that tree look like it's in the right place? <laughs> no, no. If you said yes, I did not hear you. But <laughs> so this is all about what is the purpose of this tree? Do you want it for shade? Do you want it for wildlife viewing? Do you want it just as an ornamental? And then with that, then you think about how this tree grows. Does it grow straight up? Is it wide? Is it a, a vase shape? Does it droop? Um, and then what kind of conflicts could there be? Again, with the, with the power lines above ground or you know, maybe there's a gas line or water lines underneath, just knowing where you're placing this tree so you're not causing any issues. And then of course the rooting area, so that goes back to having those foundation issues. If you're having a tree that has a large root area, it's going to get underneath your house. Um, and so some, some trees look like they wouldn't have a huge rooting area, but then they end up having a vast rooting area just because they prioritize the nutrient uptake from the soil rather than like having more leaves on top. It's again going back to that behavior of the specific tree. And then, of course, just knowing what kind of sun it's going to get, the soil, moisture, and hardiness, because all trees require a different amounts. Some require full, sh full shade, some, or not full shade, but partial shade, and some require full sun. Some like clay, some like sand, some like loam. Some trees are just really, really temperamental, and you can't always place the tree that you want in your yard or wherever you want to plant it. And then, of course, pests. Um, <laughs> raise your hand if you like crepe myrtle. Get out, get out. <laughs> I'm just kidding, uh, but I, I do not like grape myrtles. Um, but they are beautiful trees, they're overplanted, but because they're overplanted, we also have a really big issue with crepe myrtle bark scale, which of course isn't horrible for the tree, it's not detrimental to its health necessarily, but it is uh, ugly looking. It, it's, it takes away from the beauty of the crepe myrtle. So. Just knowing what pest you're going to get into with your different species, especially those ornamentals, they tend to attract the most. Um, so this is what I was talking about. So this is one of the resources that goes into the different trees and all of their specs, going into if they're native to the US, if they are native to Texas. Um, and then you can go to what you want to use this tree for. So maybe you want an evergreen tree. It goes and it says if it's evergreen or not. Um, or if maybe you want one that has showy fruit, has this column, uh, all the way down to the soil, the sun. 
if it's tolerant of heat, if it's tolerant of cold, um, salt, and I can't really say it's poor, poor quality, but going in and making sure that you are understanding your tree before you plant it, biggest step you can take to avoid any sort of issues. What is it? It's, um, it, it saves a lot of money, saves a lot of time, and it's most likely going to save, like prolong the life of the tree in general because we need to keep planting trees. So wrong tree, wrong place. So as you can see, got these trees growing right up against the house, tearing it apart or tearing up the concrete. This can all be avoided if uh, you just have the, the correct prescription of tree. And then so from there, we move on to proper tree care. I'm just going to run down some basics as much as I can. Um, let's see here. So like I said, it all starts with selecting the right, the right tree. So when you're at a nursery, right or left? Yeah. You guys aren't first graders, yeah. <laughs> but um, so you just want to make sure that you're not having multiple leads when you're selecting a young tree. Multiple leads can, uh, so when, when it matures, if it's not taken care of soon enough, it can lead to very weak unions and that tree can split. Um, so who, who knows uh, the, what is the Bradford pear? Yeah, Bradford pear is notorious. Af after the freeze, I drove around and I saw several that had split. Um, and then also you want to make sure that, I wish I had a laser pointer so you could see, but I have this. So like right here, you want to make sure that you can see your root flare, um, because if not, it's probably been buried too deep, which is poor for the, the tree's health. And then also, here's a big one. If you look over here, oh man, a lot, like so many trees that you buy in the nursery, they haven't been switched out of the pot in a long time, and so the roots start circling the entire root ball. And that, can, that leads to girdling roots. So if you don't get that taken care of before you plant the tree, that tree's gonna be stunted and it's not gonna live very long. It's gonna choke itself out eventually. And then um, right here, doo -doo 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 -doo. and then of course the healthy form, good leaves. See on this image here, you can see that the leaves are yellowing, it's going through fluorosis, it's missing something, it's just not doing so great. And then look for good bark. And then wide angle crotches for strength. I think this is a question I get a lot. They say, you have to come look at my tree, Maddie. I'm like, okay, okay. And so I go and I look at their tree and it, it's straight up like this, but then they have a tree, that, a, a branch that goes like that. A lot of people think that you want branches like this for strength, but in reality, this sort of angle is the strongest angle you can have. This is the least likely to fail. When you have a V like that, it is most likely, like it, it is more likely to fail and it's gonna rip and it's gonna take down a lot of bark with it as well. They create a lot of compression wood and reaction wood in uh, that branch union, especially when it's at more of a 90 degree that keeps it super, super sturdy. And then planting a tree. So I don't know if you guys know, but we have Arbor Day next weekend, Saturday. Anyone, who, who is registered, anyone? One person, two people, you're on my committee, come on. <laughs> Three, okay, I'm gonna need that to be all of you by the end of today, just saying. But we'll be planting a bunch of trees at Bergfeld Park and TR Griffith, but so we'll just do a refresher course because you all are going to sign up by the end of today. Um, so when you are planting a tree, you wanna make sure, the biggest thing is not to plant it too deep more often than not, that is the number one mistake, is that people just put the tree in way too deep. You want to go back to that trunk flare, make sure that you can see it, and have it a couple inches above the ground. And then for the hole, whatever your pot size is, at least two, two times the pot size, but ideally four to six times that pot, which is a huge hole, if, especially if you have a 15-gallon tree. But if you have, you know, a, a one-gallon, a three-gallon, five-gallon, that's a lot more doable. Um, and then the one thing I will say no to about this image particularly is the, the stakes. The stakes are unnecessary, especially for a younger tree. Um, there are some cases where you need to go back and you need to stake it, but for the most part, staking a tree can actually weaken the roots and it takes longer for the tree to establish. Not to mention, when you do stake the tree, more often than not, people leave the guying way too long and it starts digging into the trunk 
girdling the tree, starving the tree. So say no to steaks unless absolutely necessary. And Why do you make the hole that much bigger? Because it loosens up the soil to allow the roots to go out more, more quickly to establish themselves. Yeah. Uh, so they don't ha hit, because when you dig a hole, you slick the dirt, like wherever the shovel goes, that dirt's going to be slick. And so it's, the roots are going to have a much harder time penetrating that versus loose fill that's back in there. Do you put the same dirt back in or do mm -hmm. you put other dirt? No, you put the same dirt back in. So um, just giving it more space to kind of spread its roots out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, same dirt, same dirt. Um, this goes into mulching. Um, mulching <laughs> apparently uh, is, a, I guess, a lot more technical than you would think. Because, uh, so not only is it super great for the tree, so whenever you plant a tree, go ahead and put a ring around it. Um, it holds in moisture, it gives nutrients, it breaks down. Super great for the tree. But, um, the, but people do tend to put too much mulch. Um, so when you are mulching, you want to remove any of the grass that there might be. So that goes back to when you dig the hole and there is still the turf on that grass. Go ahead and like just... Um, Jiggle, was that the word? Like jiggle the dirt out and then toss the turf. Um, make sure there's no, there's no turf and then you just pour natural mulch around like shredded hardwood mulch, that would be perfect. And then the biggest mistake is you don't want the mulch to actually touch the base of the tree. That holds on too much moisture to the tree causing disease and decay to enter in through there because it weakens it. And then so, these are some like fairly good examples. I would probably make both of these rings maybe a little bit bigger. But you can see here that it, they took it away from the, the taper and it's just all towards where the tree will be rooting. And so right here you can see this tree is much larger. So they add in a huge mulch ring. So typically, you know, if you have a tree that big, you could extend 10 feet out from the base of the trunk. But you could also go all the way to the drip line, just because the way tree, tree roots grow, so many people are under the impression that tree roots just grow straight down. Whenever you look up at a, a artwork image, the tree, the tree roots just go down and the crown goes out like this. But really, the tree roots can extend two, three times what the crown is. So typical practice would be to go to the drip, to the drip line, just making sure that all of the roots are receiving that extra moisture and nutrients. Do, do, do. So, what is this? Yeah, it's a mulch volcano. <laughs> Please stay away from these. You, I, I, it's, it's such a shame to drive around, around Tyler and so many of the landscaping companies too, they also are guilty of putting these mulch volcanoes around a tree because they hear, oh, mulch, good for a tree. Okay, well, let's just give it extra mulch. But then they end up crippling the tree because they do this. Um, I also get a lot of questions about tree watering. So most people don't realize that it actually takes two to three years for a tree to fully establish itself. So you want to make sure you are providing plenty of water, especially in the first couple of weeks after transplant. Your tree will go through transplant shock, it'll lose all its leaves, but the number one thing you can do is to continue watering it, probably like every other day for the first week and then you can begin to taper that off and just making sure you're going by and you're inspecting, seeing how dry that soil is. If you just dig a little hole, like just, and, and you just feel to see if it's wet within two inches. If it still has moisture, you don't have to water it. But if it's dry, go ahead and give it some water. You can use like a garden hose is probably the best method, just going around the ring of the tree. Uh, a lot of people rely on their overhead sprinklers, which I, I don't recommend overhead sprinklers. They're not great for trees. It can actually cause too much moisture to stick onto the trunk and it can lead to just like growing of moss. And it's just that can weaken the bark, which can lead in disease. Anyway, so using drip line or a hose would be the best method. Um, and then, do, do, do. and so yeah, so another thing is people tend <laughs> They're like, oh, well, my tree's dying. I need to water it. But then the trees, if they end up watering it too much, and so when it's too much, it, be, it creates anaerobic conditions in the soil, which then kills the tree roots, which then kills the tree. So just making sure you just have that healthy balance between um, water and dry conditions because it still needs oxygen. So then this takes us to pruning. I'm not going to go too much into pruning just because there's a lot 
to it, but some basics would be to, this is a really great image because it shows things that you really want to avoid in tree structure. So right here, this has two leaders. I had mentioned that earlier, how you don't want to have two leaders because eventually it will split. Um, and then down here, just like mangled or, um, or uh, what's the word? What's another word for mangled? Misshapen. Yeah, misshapen, there we go, a misshapen limb. Or you have these that are um, growing too close together um, or growing back towards the tree. Or this one, you can see it's diseased. It has a cavity. It has a broken branch here. It removes suckers. And then right here is the big one that goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the girdling roots when you're buying a new tree. Um, if the roots are circling this, when they get big like that, they'll end up just choking out the entire tree. So, you know, you can have, a gird you can have girdling roots for the first several years, and the tree seems to be doing fine. But once your tree gets to that certain size, it's going to just, it's going to start declining. Okay, so when you're planting a tree, that's the best time to do it. You can technically do it when the tree's established, but it's more likely to let in disease. But so you go to the nursery, you have girdling roots. What you can do, the best way to do it would probably be to wash the roots just to get all the dirt out. And then you can just pull them apart and you can, and you can loosen them up that way. But if you don't have time for that, you can score the sides. So just taking a saw and just going through and just cutting it up and then kind of loosening that tight root ball and taking, um, like just taking it out. That's a little more rough, but if you have access to a hose or something like that, it's probably best just to wash it all out and then just going through and just manually straightening them out. Okay. And another thing is people tend to prune too much. Uh, so younger trees, they can take about 25% of their limbs removed, but anything more than that is it's too much, uh, especially when you get into mature trees. They can't handle that sort of stress as well, so keep it to less than 10%. Ideally, you don't want to take anything that you don't have to take off um, because every wound is an access point for bacteria or fungus or whatnot. So, And then uh, this right here is a nice chart. I don't know if you guys wanted a picture of that or something, just to kind of go over how often you should prune. Um, but let's here. And then, of course, pruning in the winter is the best. Uh, right now, I'm in the middle of pruning season. My guys are out today pruning. Uh, it's just the best time because it's less likely to spread disease. The trees are dormant. It's um, minimal stress. But technically, you can prune throughout the entire year, except oaks. I wouldn't do that in early spring or summer. Um, then this is just how to make a cut. So too often people rely on, a, uh, they think the closer to the tree you can get the best, but the way that trees heal themselves is again, wish I had a laser pointer, this right here, that bulge. Um, so that's the, that's the branch collar. So that's where all of the enzymes and the hormones and everything that a tree needs to heal itself, it's in there. So when you cut too close, like let's say you cut, if you follow my cursor, if you cut like that, you cut all of that activity off, and so it's un, it's uh, it, it can't heal itself after that. So it's better to leave too much of a stub than not enough, because um, at least it would all of that um, that branch collar would still be there. So the best way to do it is just to you know make a little undercut, and then you go out further, you cut that off, and then you go back and you make your final cut right where that bulge ends. The reason you make three cuts is because if you were to cut all of it at once. Again, it's going to split and it's going to tear that bark off, leaving a huge gaping wound. And then, doo, 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 doo. So here are some examples of some bad cuts. So here right here we have a flush cut and a bark tear right there. And then these are those stub cuts. Again, this would probably be better than this, but this is still not ideal. You'd want it to be like right there. Because I don't know if you can see it very well on the projector, but you can actually see the branch collar right there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> if there is one thing you guys take from today, it's please <laughs> stop the top. Crepe myrtles are not not exempt. Um, so it is absolutely the worst thing you can do for your tree. I'm sure you drive around Tyler, you see it everywhere. It hurts my heart. 
Um, but I mean, this is this this kills your tree. This leaves it open to disease, decline. You are starving the tree. You're taking off all of its foliage. It's on. It, it, it's staggering how many people still do this. You would think that at, at, by now that enough people, especially landscape companies, would know not to top their trees, but they don't. They don't. Um, so. I'm sure you guys know, but when you top a tree, it triggers that response where it shoots up a bunch of limbs to try to, to, try to re-sprout. But those limbs are always just weakly attached. They will fall. It's, when you top your tree, it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> yes, but so this is a heading cut. So um, it cr like I, I crate myrtles are more tolerant of it than other species, but they still can't thrive under this condition because when you have a heading cut, like I was going, that like go back to what I was saying about the branch collar, where you have that that area of where it can, like that's the tree's medicine cabinet basically. That's where it can heal itself and close a wound. That's not existent when you top a tree like this. So. I will say crepe myrtles are more tolerant of it, but crepe myrtles are tolerant of a lot of things. Um, I was just thinking about the part where it says it starves the tree by removing foliage. Mm -hmm. The tree's already gone, but you're saying it's the following. Well, yeah. So, well, yeah, and but on, but on top of that, like it does starve the tree because you're removing all of the leaves, but so it's expending its energy resources by sending out new buds and new and new limbs that it so that is energy that could be used elsewhere. And so when it's taking that energy to shoot out all of the limbs, it's using more energy than it would have, which would starve the tree. Well, yeah, and then absolutely that. And it's ugly. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And so this kind of, that just kind of illustrates what I was saying. Like when you top a tree, it, sh it sends out all of these very small, those very small sprouts, which it just leaves the tree, uh, again, misshapen, deformed, whereas this would be the same tree, but it's been taken care of, it's been pruned correctly, and it has those strong branches. And then just a couple other things just to look at when you're looking at the trees on your property, just kind of big, uh, looking for insect activity if you're just noticing more and more bugs than usual on that particular tree it's probably in decline. Um, and then leaf size and color, if there's chlorosis, if it's yellowing, or if it's splotchy, it has black spots on the leaves. Um, trunk damage is a huge one, especially when you have people who are maintaining your yard, maybe with the string trimmers, they start cutting into the bark. That's a wound. Um, fungus, I can't tell you how many times I've had to break people's hearts because I go and I take a look at their tree. It's a huge, beautiful tree. Canopy looks great, fantastic, but there's fungus all up and down the tree. That fungus means it's decaying, it's losing its structural integrity, that tree is on its way out. Um, cracks and cavities, or again, or like with a recent lean. So leans aren't necessarily bad with trees because they create that reaction wood, the compression wood. Uh, so it can, if it's grown that way, it's a fairly strong tree, unless, of course, that angle is dramatic. But if it's a recent lean, that means that the roots are starting to give, and that tree needs to come down, especially if there's a structure nearby. And then sawdust, that's from the ambrosia beetle. Um, and then this is what you'll see a lot. So this I take with a grain of salt for the next couple of years, just from that freeze. Um, so we, do, we are seeing a lot of dieback in trees, but that doesn't necessarily mean that tree's got to come out. Um, but if, so we're hoping that this next season, if we don't have another freeze, <laughs> um, the trees will start leafing out a lot more. Okay, so galls are really interesting. So not my forte, but galls are, um, they don't have an effect on the trees that's purely cosmetic. So for example, like the like a wasp, it's it's typically wasps, correct? Anyone know? I think it's just wasps, but um, that it's it's really I can't speak on this a whole lot, but I do know that there's something about the chemistry of a wasp or the insect and the chemistry of the wood that react to create that nesting site for that insect. So it, it's not bad for the tree necessarily. There might be some that are bad for the tree. Again, I don't know. Um, 
but it, it's just a chemical reaction between the two. It's, I, I, don't, I don't think it's symbiotic necessarily, but it's purely cosmetic. They look really cool. My favorite one is the uh, white oak, uh, the white oak gall. It looks straight out of Dr. Seuss. It's hot pink, or it's bubblegum pink with hot pink polka dots. And it's fuzzy. It's so cool. <laughs> Okay, so, <laughs> and so this just is my, it's, a, it's an ending slide just to let you know that if you, like, you need to start paying attention to your trees, understanding how they're behaving um, to avoid things like this. If you notice any change, honestly, all you need to do is just call a professional. They're there for a reason. You have professionals for everything. So if you are worried for any reason, they'll come out there and they'll, they'll speak with you. They can come take a look at if you're worried about the, the roots or if you think that the crown is declining, whatever, or if you see some bugs you don't recognize. Have someone come out here. I do recommend to make sure you have tree professionals come out. Make sure that they, are, um, they have credentials, they're insured. They know what they're doing. Um, so ISA certified arborists, those are, that's the who you should be looking for. We have several around town. Um, and if you need a tree removal, don't just go with the lowest bid. Go ahead and just get multiple opinions from multiple people. Like, what, I, what did I say? I said, um, everyone has their own forte, you know? So some people are really great at disease and pests. Some people are really great about structural issues. Um, or fertilizing or what have you. So just going, making sure you're talking to multiple people. Um, just like you would go to the doctor and, and if they don't quite say what you would think, you'd go and find another doctor just to hear what they're, if it's a general cons consensus or not. Maddie, yes? Can you talk about um, tree trimmers who use spikes to climb the tree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you are hiring someone to just trim your tree, not removing, just trimming the tree, getting up into the canopy. If they have spikes on their boots, do not hire them. Do not let them climb your tree. Those spikes, they all leave little um, wounds in the bark. I have a hiccup coming, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so if, they, if they insist on using spikes, don't hire them. Any competent or um, like, tree verse person, they're not, they're not going to use spikes. If they care about the health of your tree, they're not going to use spikes. Unless it's for removal, that's different. The tree's coming down anyways. Um, but yes, stay away from spikes. <laughs> this one? Well, so, I mean, of course you can't know just from a photo, but what I would assume, it looks like there was maybe some a, a huge storm that came in. So my guess with this is, it, this is probably by the street. So it probably had a limited rooting zone. And, and then on top of that, if it got a lot of saturation from a huge storm, and it, you can see the canopy's humongous. There's, there's a ton of limbs. So the combination of all those factors, if it's limited rooting zone, and then it gets oversaturated from standing water, and then some wind comes in and it just throws that tree, that's what could happen. Well, not necessarily. So if you, ha if you have a tree that has a, like, if you have a huge canopy, what you can do is you can hire people to prune out any branches that aren't necessary, lower that weight, things like that, making sure that there's good drainage in your yard, making sure there's no standing water around a rooting zone, things like that. Um, yes? Can't you change the landscape or something? So if you're changing the landscape, by the tree, you would be disturbing the roots to some. Yeah, so you just, yeah, you have to understand the entire, like your entire yard that you're working with. And so if you have a way to um, change drainage patterns to get away from maybe your trees at the bottom of a hill and then you have a, like a concrete barrier or something, changing where that water drains, that's an easy way. So, or having like a water catchment system. Rain barrels. <laughs> it 
Yeah, so, I mean, like I said, it was probably up next towards a street. So when you have that concrete barrier, that, that rooting zone is really short. And so especially if, like, it's a wind going that way, because that rooting zone is so short, the, it can't ground itself as much on that side. And so that goes back to making sure you're having the correct tree in the correct place. Because if you have a tree that needs a lot of space for its roots, but you plant it in between the street and a sidewalk, it's going to be constricted and it's not going to be as structurally sound as if maybe you put a smaller tree there, something that doesn't need a huge rooting zone. So that's where that all comes back to. Do you remember what kind of tree that was? I was looking at this tree and I honestly did not know. I don't think it's in the US. Um, I'm not sure. I took, well, actually it might be. I'm not sure though. Or it might be in the, in the north. I know the south. <laughs> It looks like some sort of cypher, cedar, yeah. cedar, yeah, but I could not tell you the specifics. Um, but that pretty much wraps it up for my presentation, but I did want to plug a few events that the city will be having, so next weekend I already was on you guys about registering. You guys are going to do that. Write that link down, put your t-shirt size, there will be free food. Um, <laughs> So there are two different plantings, though. There's one in the morning at Bergfeld Park. Everyone loves Bergfeld, but I also wanted to show some love to T.R. Griffith. It's in North Tyler, and so we're going to be planting a few trees there as well. It's going to be a much smaller event, though. Um, and then also February 26th, Saturday, we're going to be having our seedling giveaway. So we'll have about 16 or 1,800 seedlings that we'll be giving out. It'll be a drive through most likely. Um, so if you haven't been, you should go. It's a lot of fun, isn't it? So it's going to be um, it's going to be at the at the Mother Francis on South Broadway by Cumberland, the sports one. It'll most likely be there. But final details still pending. This was just an, uh, just approved a couple days ago. So. Uh, uh, if we come like to Bergfeld Park uh -huh. and we're going to help plant trees, uh -huh. do we need to bring shovels? No. Um, shovels will be provided unless of course you want to bring your own some people are really attached to their tools we had people last year bring their own stuff so if you wanted to you can bring your own um, but we, we will have shovels to provide yes So I know nothing about fruit trees, um, which everyone always asks about fruit trees. Um, I could not tell you, unfortunately. Um, but I, I guess I should just start learning about some more fruit trees. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. AgriLife would be a great resource. Um, yes. I'm going to comment something that I've learned at a uh, certified You know, most people usually don't read everything on the back of the bag. It says keep it away from trees. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I think that's kind of important to know. I'm mm -hmm. trying to educate folks on that. Does that yeah. apply to any, um, like, uh, pre-emergent type fertilizer, I mean, uh, herbicide um, in the, no, no, within no, the, just, the it's drip a, it's zone the of the tree? Weed, yeah, mm -hmm. not, a, not a selective herbicide, but atrazine is the ingredient that's toxic and it's my understanding all the weed and feed different brands, Scott's and whatever, they all have that, that ingredient in it. Yeah. And it was a certified arborist here in Tyra that uh, taught the course and he was really preaching on that. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Yes. Where at? This one right here? 
This one, yeah. Um, so I mean, the, the one thing that's not great about it is how little mulch there is. Like there, it should be a lot wider for that size of tree, but you wanna see that trunk flare. That, that is what your tree should look like. You wanna see that taper. And you keep the weed eaters away. And, ke and it keeps the weed eaters away. Mm -hmm. Let's say you go into nature and, mm -hmm. and you park, they mm -hmm. park, they're mm -hmm. not gonna see that. And your um, trees are flourishing as well. I mean, you, you'll, you see that quite often, but this is in a landscape position, so of course you don't have the leaves that are on the canopy floor, things like that, but that, when you, when you see trees in natural settings, oftentimes they do look like this. Um, maybe not always, but they're, they're covered up by maybe some, some leaves or some debris or things like that. But mo most typically, if that tree's doing well, you're going to be seeing that. And what does the tree above it, are you, what are you trying to there? Oh, I was just showing how much mulch there was um, to go to the drip line. Yeah. Yes. Um, who? What's the question? Just. Yeah, I mean, that's probably something to ask the Forest Service, what they're doing, anything that, mm hmm um, I know that they spray for ticks all the time. Um, a lot of land managers will spray for ticks. I mean, I don't know about in Texas, but I don't think we have a big Lyme issue here, but I do know that in this, the other southeastern it's, states. It's oh, no. Down. Okay. You're right. I think, I think people aren't looking at it because it, it'd be nice to look at it before it really mm -hmm. spreads. Better to be pre proactive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, did you say with all the damage from the freeze? Yeah, so I mean, that's a big thing. Um, we, arborists and foresters are concerned mostly right now about um, the pine trees because the, the trees are stressed. Right now they are showing, so, some trees have gotten pine beetle infestations, but moving forward, because trees die very slowly when they're underneath a lot of stress, it takes time for them to show symptoms and signs. And so that everyone's on high alert to kind of see what the, the pine beetle infestation rate is going to be over the next couple of years. Yes. Well, so that goes back down to the individual tree. So that resource, like if you, wa if you want me to send you that resource, I will, that shows if they need sun or not. Because some are, you know, some trees are understory trees. You plant them in your yard, they're not going to want to be in full sun. But some trees, like the shade trees, they most likely want full sun. So it just, it just comes down to species. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's sad. That's sad. But yeah, that's another thing to be on the lookout for as well. Yeah. I I could I could talk for hours, honestly. <laughs> oh, you can spray for ants. You can spray. Um, you look for signs. Um, if you see any signs of ant activity, because um, I mean, you, um, you can get someone to come out there and spray, and it won't harm the tree. So, y yes. Did you have your hand up? Someone. Oh, yes. How can you get to the front of my house and make it? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, are you in? Um, so, because I work for the city, it, most of my time is devoted t towards, I, like I said, I'm a team of one, so um, I, a lot of my time is there, but I have 
great contacts that will just come out there and talk to you. Like they don't, yeah, the, and some people who will know for sure. But because I'm with the city, it's kind of hard to find time, which I wish I could. I, I wish I had more time to go out because that's what I love doing. But unfortunately, I'm in front of a computer a lot. So. How much uh, water is required for a large tree in the wintertime? Again, comes back down to species and um, how large it is. I, I couldn't speak to that figure just because it really depends. But a large oak tree. Really? Well, it depends on soil type as well. <laughs> um, but but there are there are tons of tables and figures online that you can find. Just make sure it comes from something like um, a government agency or an educational institution. Yeah. So guys, I think we need to give her a big hand. She's done a wonderful job. I think we're all day long. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, of course, of course.